know how they're going to win. Because if they don't know how they're going to win, they're not going to win, which means you're not going to win. So, um, you know, figure out what the industry is, what the split is between the base and the bonus or commission and put it out there. Now, particularly for salespeople, even if they're account managers, you absolutely should have a quota. And a quota means, um, as any of the financial people that are on the call will know, it's how, you know, if, if we're expecting a million dollars in sales, and we don't say we're expecting a million dollars in sales or $330,000 in gross margin, how are we going to get that? We're not. We're going to get something far, far, far short of that. Well, then how can you possibly budget for your business? right? You don't know. So they have to, the commission absolutely has to be structured based on whatever their quota is. So what I did for my salespeople, and I've seen a lot of companies do the same, and in fact, I'm sure I got it from another company, was that their quota was um, $330,000 in gross margin. What I did is that I had a percentage that they were paid out of that, you know, so there was a I don't even remember now what the percentage was, um, but the percentage went up um, if they got there sooner than the end of the year. So we paid out their commission every month, and then um, you know we kept calculating it on an annual basis. So if they had to come in with thirty three hundred and thirty thousand dollars in gross margin, and they hit it by month ten, so they still had two more months in the year to go. Um, they would get those last two months paid at a higher commission rate than they would prior to that. So they'd get an extra 2% on that money. So they had the ability to earn more money the faster they got there, which for me, I didn't care because they were bringing in extra money. So everybody won on that situation. Now, the one year I did make a little bit of a mistake with this is I said that, you know, if anybody got there early, in addition to the extra money, you could also take some time off if you got there sooner. Well, I had a superstar guy who got there uh, at like month nine, and he decided to take six weeks off and go to Europe. Well, <clears throat> any of you who are working territories know that when you take that kind of time off, um, you generally have to start over. And so naturally, he started over from ground zero and had a really tough time for the next six months, which meant I had a tough time because sales were not coming in. For those of you out there, don't do that. Uh, time off is not a good <laughs> reward for that. It's always based um, on money. And so typically when you have a, a quota plan, you would say, okay, I expect them to sell X. They're gonna bring in this much gross margin. They're gonna be paid um, this much commission on that, which their total compensation plan should equal $100,000. So let's just say, you've got a commission structure that says 80, it's gonna be an 80-20 split. So that means $80,000 of that $100,000 is gonna be base salary, right? Just like everybody else. But there's 20,000 that is gonna be based on commission and you want them to come up with, let's say half a million dollars in sales with, with whatever gross margin. And then you would pay a percentage that would get them to that other $20,000 by the end of the year. Now, most salespeople, particular hunters, are very, very motivated about earning money. So they're motivated to go beyond what it is you tell them. So you never want to put a cap on what they can earn. So if you said the maximum you could earn is $20,000 and this person brought in two or three huge deals towards the end of the year and suddenly they couldn't earn commission on those last deals, this would not be a happy person. And you should not be upset because you're actually getting additional sales that they would not ha you would not have otherwise. So you never want to put a top limit on it. Now, the reason that you would always enforce the bottom limit, however, is that they get no commission if you if they don't make quota. So if they're not getting to where um, to what you want, you know they don't hit their number as of you know that month. Now you are stuck paying all these bills and they're, um, you know, they haven't brought in their money. They don't get any extra money that month either. So because the nature of sales in some companies does move around, it goes back and forward. Um, one of the things um, 
uh, you can do is have a, a monthly bonus, but then have a quarterly roundup. So let's say you're, you're uh, trying to get, you know, in my case, I was trying to get $330,000 in gross margin per year. They got every, the first month, they didn't hit their quota. Their second month, they didn't hit their quota. Their third month, they blew it out of the water and then came, you know, back in, in line for the quarter. Then they could potentially earn those commissions back from Q1 and Q2. Typically, I would true up. And then I would also, um, what I really wanted to reinforce was them making their annual quota, which is why I gave them additional if they got there early and then some way to make it up because ultimately yes i would like to know when it's coming in during the year but if it comes in that's really what i'm looking for so i didn't want to penalize them for you know doing great the second six months and kind of doing terrible the first six months so that's a very very long way to say that um, depends on your industry depends on what sort of a split you want but always always have a quota if it's an internal person, so an account manager type of person, higher salary with a bonus potential or a very small split on that quota because they're not as motivated by the money. They're more motivated by um, trying to make that customer happy and taking care of them. So a little bit different motivation, so you want to pay differently. So probably a bonus would be more in line if indeed that's what your industry does. All right. So let's go to question eight, which is um, how should um, you hire for a salesperson? Well, the first thing you want to do as a, a CEO of your organization, which I'm assuming most of you are the owners, is that you should always, always, always be on the lookout for this person. I tell a lot of the entrepreneurs uh, that have come through the classes, you have two jobs. Um, and that's to grow your company and to grow your people. And if you're doing those two things, you are always looking out there to see who else um, can I bring onto the team, right? Um, because if you're the one doing all the sales, you can't be wearing all the other hats in the business and you really should be focusing on that strategy. So you're gonna wanna bring in somebody, um, hopefully like yourself, right? So first of all, be on the lookout for this person before you need them, okay? So you should be looking to all of your uh, competitors and saying, hmm, who's over there that I could potentially poach? Who do I want? The other place that you should be looking for them is any, act in, any interaction that you might have with any potential salesperson from any company. You know, if this person treated you really well or you had a really good sales experience with this person, generally they probably have the traits that a good salesperson would have. So therefore, you know, this might be somebody who might be interested. So I've often said to people, um, have you ever thought about changing careers? You know, hey, we've got this really cool company and we sell X, Y, and Z. If you ever think about changing, here's my card. Give me a call. Always be thinking about it before you actually need it. So the second, then let's just say that's one of the things you should always be um, doing, looking for. Um, but you should um, figure out uh, the job description that you have for this person. And um, what I like to do in a job description is one paragraph about what this person's responsible for, one uh, listing of the required characteristics, and one listing of the desired characteristics. So let's say you're hiring for a hunter, okay? You need somebody who's not shy, who is not afraid to go up to um, businesses or potential people and try to pitch your product, who is good and personable, and in fact, charismatic would be typically what you would see in a good salesperson. Somebody who's not afraid to ask for the order, ask for the sale. This is what people usually get stuck on. Um, and so you, that person is gonna have a very outgoing, extroverted, in most cases, personality. Um, and so when you find this person, you're uh, gonna bring them in, assuming let's say everything checks out, um, you know, they're qualified for the job. Then you're gonna do some interviewing based on the values of your organization, but also behavior-based interviewing based on what this person has done before. 
I would say that for most of you, hiring a, a completely brand new green salesperson, um, probably not the way to go. If this is your first salesperson hire, you do want somebody with a little bit of experience because um, you can't afford to make a mistake. Remember that a hiring mistake is three times their annual salary. So if it's a $100,000 person, this ends up being a $300,000 mistake, which I don't think you want. Um, so you're going to, for salespeople, particularly an outside salesperson, I'm gonna interview them three times. And the reason I'm gonna interview them three times is that I'm gonna, first of all, bring them into the office and I'm gonna see how they're dressed, right? I don't want this person not wearing something decent that would be a good representation of my company if they're out there meeting other people. I'm going to see how they show up in person. That's the first one. The second interview, I'm going to meet them probably at a restaurant for a cup of coffee or lunch or something like that. Because A, I want to look at their table manners. I do not want this person in front of my um, customers if they have terrible ta table manners, right? That's, that's going to be a complete reflection on you. So it gives you an opportunity. Now you've had two opportunities to see how they're dressed, and uh, A, if they've got decent manners, and by the way, if they show up on time, because you, you can't monitor in the field, and so you don't want somebody who's constantly late seeing all of your, your customers. That would be embarrassing. Um, and then uh, for the third uh, interview, generally if it's a salesperson, I'm gonna have them come into the office, and I'm gonna have them make a presentation about what they're gonna do for me in the first 30, 60, or 90 days, and how they're gonna to get to their quota. And so I'm gonna have them um, present that to me because ultimately they're gonna be presenting to a customer. And if you use behavioral-based interview questions when you're hiring them, such as, you know, tell me about the best sale that you've ever had. How did that go? What was great about it? It's gonna be an actual experience and you'll get to hear how they sold, why they sold, why it was important to them. A lot of those same questions are going to be true for an account manager, but typically this person's going to be in the office. This one's going to be somebody on the phone. So they better have a really good phone voice and they better really care about that other person and making sure that that customer is happy because they're the ones responsible for keeping that customer for you for a very long time. So, um, and you should probably have some of the other team on the interview. Like if you have a service team as well, you might want to have somebody from the service team in there because they're going to have to work hand in glove typically, or, you know, maybe your marketing team or something like that. But particularly if it's a smaller company, you want this person to fit in and they are going to be um, wired a little bit differently than um, some of the other people because they're generally kind of going out there, particularly if they're a hunter. All right, let's go to slide nine. Let's see, that is um, what tools can you use to screen? So there's a whole bunch of them out there. The, the tool that I like the most for any hiring position is called Strengths Finders. And this is the one um, uh, where there's 34 th talents that they call themes that can be built into strengths. And so there's seven or eight of those talents that you might be looking for um, with, a, with a salesperson. And particularly a hunter, you're going to be looking for woo, which is winning others over. You're going to be looking for achiever, competition, uh, relator, uh, individualization. There's a number of different ones out there. Um, another screening tool that you can use is called Caliper. It's K-A-L-I-P-E-R. Um, and that one does have a specific um, job description and profile for a salesperson, and it actually is pretty predictive of whether they're going to do well. You can use DISC. Um, you can use a number of different ones. But sometimes it's, it's a good idea to do one of those um, screening tools at the end. Um, you're also going to be um, hiring to values, right? Don't forget to hire based on um, what the values of your organization are, because I don't care how good the salesperson is, if they don't share the values of your organization, they are not going to be a good fit. And for me, particularly with um, hunters and or account managers, it's always about past performance, right? So if they were... Um, at the previous company for 20 years doesn't necessarily mean they're going to be great for your company. It just means they've had 20 years experience. I hired a very high level salesperson for an organization that I was working with, helped them, you know, do a screen, find this person. So we went out on LinkedIn, 
Um, we posted the job there. We posted the job on any a number of the different job boards um, that are out there. Uh, and particularly if there are, if you have industry groups that you belong to, those are great places to look for job descriptions and or post your jobs when you um, find them. Um, for salespeople, I would not necessarily use, um, you know, some of the uh, lower end uh, job boards. Um, you're going to want to use um, a little bit higher up um, for those. And so um, it, if you, you know, post them out there, you get them in. And in this one particular case, we, we ended up with, um, oh gosh, I think I had four uh, candidates. Two of them came from LinkedIn. Two of them came through our general ad. Make sure that the positions are posted on your website too, by the way. Everybody looks there these days as well. Uh, and we had two people with a lot of experience, one with partial experience. And so what we ended up doing, uh, we brought them all in after a phone screen, brought them all in for an in-person interview. And the one guy that had had 20 years experience and knew everybody in the industry just sort of sat there telling us about, you know, all the people he knew and what he did. The other guy spent all the time asking us about what we wanted and what would fit. And then they did presentations. And the one guy who spent asking us all the questions made a fabulous presentation with PowerPoint, which told me how he would present in front of the client. The other one said, hey, I didn't really think I needed to do that since we know each other so well. It made it very, very easy to make an offer to the person who actually used the PowerPoint. Um, so by going through that three interview process, particularly with salespeople, you can often weed out um, the bad ones and not, you know, and, and really hire to fit for your organization. But past performance predicts um, future behavior. So be sure and interview for the behaviors you're looking for and also interview for values. And the last slide we have, which is uh, number 10, um, which is how can you best measure and follow up with salespeople? Well, this is um, salespeople, account managers and hunters, hunters or farmers, however you want to call them. It's one of the easiest positions in your organization to actually measure up and follow up with because it's all metric driven. If you say they're supposed to bring in a half a million dollar sales in a year and they don't, well, that's a pretty easy conversation. You should be monitoring it throughout the year and you should have milestones for them. So when you bring in a brand new salesperson, you better have 30, 60, and 90 day goals for them. And you better be um, talking to them very clearly about what that looks like and what you're looking for. And if they don't measure up um, by whatever month, you know, or however long you're going to give them, that they'll be gone. Because it's very, very tangible. Either they are selling or they aren't selling. If they're not selling by the first month, um, that's when I would go in and say, well, what problems are you encountering? You know, have you been able to figure out how to handle the objections? What help do you need from us? This is what we're going to be looking for. If it's one of those where they're making phone sales and or the, and or the sales are coming in, um, you can um, uh, be, uh, if, if the sales are coming in, it's really easy to measure on a daily basis because they're like sales coming in daily. If it's one of those where the, sa the uh, sales cycle is much longer, it might be a little bit um, harder to tell what they're doing. And this is where a, a CRM or customer relations manager program can really help, um, you know, Salesforce, SalesLogic. Um, there's a whole bunch of different ones out there today, but you should have some way to, to measure and monitor their activity to see if indeed the sales are going to be coming in down the road. And they should be putting their notes in when they meet with somebody. Uh, they should be telling you, you know, what they're going to do. So all you have to do is go in and look at the software and you can kind of tell where your pipeline's at, how much they have. Um, you know, uh, when, when they expect those sales to come in, you're also going to learn if they're very good at predicting. Because the biggest challenge with salespeople, as we all know, is that they tell us um, what what they think we want to hear. Oh, yeah, I've got all these sales coming in. You know, we're going to, it's going to be great. It's going to be great. And then half of them don't close. So one of the questions I ask of experienced salespeople in an interview is, um, so what are your, what's your close ratio? Um, and they kind of, either they understand it or they don't. And they'll sort of look at you um, and answer quickly or not know how to answer. So every salesperson who's worth their salt should know how many um, 
sales, they actually close for however many quotes they put out there. Then going backwards, they should know how many proposals they need to do for that and then how many contacts they need to go. Every salesperson should have that in their head as to what it is for them, not you, but what it is for them for closing. So those are all ways that you can um, figure it out. But if by six months this person is not uh, coming through for you, that would be time to get rid of them. Um, so and make them uh, make them understand right up front that you know they are going to be monitored and that you know you're not going to be um, hesitant to make a change if they're not you know enjoying it and if they're not being successful at it because ultimately you want to set them up for success. Okay, so those I know we kind of went through a lot of that quickly, um, but we've got about ten minutes for questions. So, um, Precious, do we have any questions? Um, yes, one second, please. Thank you so much for that. Um, mm -hmm. Someone asks if there are any books or resources that go into more details on this topic. So, um, are there any books you'd recommend? Um, you know, I think the one book that I absolutely would recommend is To Sell as Human, and that's by Daniel Pink. And it really talks about the characteristics of a salesperson. Okay. Awesome. Um, so, like, in terms of commission and salaries, like, how do you recommend, you know, splitting between that, you know? Um, so that would be uh, the, first of all, go to your industry. What does your industry do? Because you don't want to be too far out of it. Okay. Um, I don't, I don't want people to, um, you know, be worried about whether or not they're going to be able to make their rent payment or their food payment. Right. So, mm -hmm. so for the most part, you know, you're going to want to be over 50% unless your industry is just one that is normal at, you know, no, um, you know, straight commission, but those ten people tend to be really hungry and sometimes they do, de um, desperate things. So I kind of like start it with, you know, 75%. Mm -hmm base salary 25 percent commission so it's more base versus um commission okay cool um someone else wants to know uh should i go with independent reps or hire full-time person um, yeah that's a good question and independent yeah. reps um depending upon the organization a lot of food distribution you mm -hmm. know use independent reps and independent reps can be great. And that used to be the way everything was sold. Yeah. But um, the challenge with independent reps is um, that they're also selling a whole bunch of other products. And you don't really know how much attention your particular product is getting. Mm -hmm. And so unless you have some way to monitor that, it can often be a big waste of time. I worked with one organization that had independent reps and I, 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 the amount of money that they paid out to these guys every month and sometimes they didn't even touch the sale because they got an automatic commission just if it came in during that territory. Right. So whether they were doing anything about our product or not, we didn't know. So I don't know. I'm not a huge fan of it. And I think the industry is really, most industries are leaning away from them. Mm -hmm. So, but hiring your own can be a little bit more expensive, but what you will get is, you know, hundred percent of that person's attention. Okay. Awesome. Um, we don't have any more questions for now. Um, okay. Yeah, so I think that's... Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. Well, yeah. what I would just tell everybody is that um, don't, it, don't worry if you make a mistake on your first hire. Just get rid of them quickly. So hire slowly, hire quickly. Um, and if any of you have any individual questions um, about this, feel free to shoot me an email. Um, it's Mary at Mary-Marshall.com and I'm happy um, to help you out. Um, but it's one of those things that, you know, once you kind of get over this hurdle and hire, you know, the person, your company will grow because it's the one position in the organization that actually brings in sales. Awesome. Thank you so much, Mary. Um, and All right. Yeah. For everyone, just a, a last reminder, um, you can find a recording of this webinar on iConnect um, under the resources tab. So yeah, thank you so much. All right, bye everybody, good luck. Bye, thank you.